Welcome to our very first hybrid talk held in front of both a live audience here in the Library Annex and a live Zoom audience. Bear with us as we find our feet in another new venture for WCML. And we're particularly grateful to today's speaker for agreeing to take part in this experiment with us. Paul Salverson will be talking to us about the 1896 events of Winter Hill. Without further ado, we're going to swap chairs. Over to you, Paul. Yeah. I mustn't slouch, you'll see half my head. So thanks very much, Lynette, for inviting me along. It's an, an honour to be asked to, to the first real live speaker after lockdown. And also, it's particularly uh, good for me being here in the Working Class Movement Library, because one of the, the key people in, in this story was uh, a Bolton working class writer called Alan Clark. And I was introduced to Alan Clark by Ruth and Eddie Frow must have been about 1970, 1971. I was at, at Lancaster University. Uh, back then, I discovered the writings of somebody called Teddy Ashton, who it turns out was, was Alan Clark uh, from Bolton. Uh, I, met, had a, I knew Ruth and Eddie pretty well by then. I was uh, knew them from my working on, on the railway. And they introduced me to Alan Clark in more detail with this very, <laughs> Very basic, so I, mean, I can imagine Ruth sort of slaving over a guest step in the machine, turning this thing off. And it was about C. Alan Clark, Lancashire author. And it was through Alan Clark and his writings that I, if you like, rediscovered the Winter Hill mass trespass of, of 1896. So uh, I, I owe a lot, well, I owe so much to Ruth, Ruth and Eddie, such a fantastic people and you know this, this really is the the monument so what i want to talk about today is the the history of the 1896 winter hill we call it a mass trespass but i'll say a bit more about that in a moment it was a huge rights of way battle probably the biggest in british history i've not come across anything uh, that bears comparison to it in terms of the numbers that were involved over three successive weekends, we're talking about 12,000 people on one day. So uh, it was a very big event, but one of the interesting things about it was that it was almost completely forgotten. And it was only thanks to Alan Clark and his book, Moorlands and Memories, that uh, the, the memory did survive. And even with that long gap between 1920, when he published his book in 1982, when we did the first commemoration. And it's just a few days since we did the latest one uh, on uh, a, a week last Sunday. A day like this, somebody up there must, must like us, and we had over a thousand people celebrating the memory of the 125 years since the Winter Hill mass trespass. And uh, there's two films being made about that. And I'll tell you a bit more about it later on towards the end of the talk. So I want to give you a, a broad overview of what happened with the amount of time that I've got. Obviously, I'm, I'm not able to go into too much detail, but I think, first of all, I'm sort of assuming that uh, most of you here in the room will know where Winter Hill is, but perhaps some people who are on Zoom won't. Uh, uh, perhaps in, in an ideal world, which we're, we're, we're never in an ideal world, I would have a nice map to show you. But if you can think of Bolton to the about 10 miles to the north of, of where we are today, and about, about three or four miles beyond there, you'll have seen Winter Hill. You might never have walked up it, although I'd recommend it, but you'll have seen it from the motorway or from the railway. It's on the right hand side as you're going along the, on the train or in the motorway when you get past uh, Horwich and, and Middlebrook. So it's a, a big expanse of moorland. Uh, back in the 19th century, it was a, a hive of industry. There was coal mining, there was some lead mining in parts of it, a lot of quarrying and so on. So it was a very productive area, but people did also walk over Winter Hill just for leisure. It was really on the doorstep 
of Bolton, uh, the area around Halliwell, a sort of working class part of, of Bolton then, as, as of now, people go for a walk over the moors on a, a Saturday afternoon after work or on a Sunday. And uh, it was, as you would expect back then, it was privately owned by the Ainsworth family. They bought the, the land in the early 19th century. Uh, they, they, if you like, they were new money. Uh, they weren't part of the traditional landed aristocracy. They, they made the money in the bleaching trade. And there was a large bleach works, again, in, in Halliwell, on the edge of, of Winter Hill. And he was quite a major employer, Colonel uh, Richard Ainsworth. And also a particularly reactionary one. Uh, back in the 1850s, there was a, a dispute with his workforce and it was commented on by some of the, uh, the, the local press at the time that he was a, in the days where employers were far from enlightened. Um, perhaps uh, nothing's changed, but there were, Ainsworth was, was regarded as being a particularly nasty piece of work. And so he owned all this land and basically took a decision totally unilaterally in August 1896 to close the moor. There was a track that went up to Winter Hill from Halliwell, which had just been, been used by people for, for generations and generations. But uh, he wanted to use it for his grow shooting. It was coming up to the grow shooting season, so he put a gate uh, across the track. Uh, with a, a trespassers will be prosecuted sign, uh, recruited a couple of extra people to act as, as gamekeepers. So I suppose that there was some <laughs> marginal economic benefit from that, uh, although people did, didn't see it that way, and stopped people going and people were absolutely horrified. And I think it says quite a lot about working class people's uh, political instincts. They, they saw themselves as having a right to, to use this path. So it wasn't, you know, when the events took place in September, people didn't see themselves as trespassing. They saw themselves as reasserting a right which had been taken away illegally by Ainsworth. So there was no deference to this at all. Uh, Ainsworth wasn't a popular person in the community and he was usurping the people's rights. So quite different from Kinder Scouts where they were quite consciously trespassing and saying, well, this land should be ours, even though it isn't at the moment. So uh, before we go on to the actual events that took place in September 1896, uh, let me just say a bit about the, the wider context in Bolton. Bolton in the 1890s was, was one of the, the biggest industrial centres in the north of England, uh, very much based on, on textiles, on cotton spinning particularly. It was the centre of uh, fine cotton spinning. It was uh, unequalled anywhere in the world at the time. It was also a textile engineering centre, which is interesting, because in 1887, there was a major strike in Bolton uh, affecting all the engineering works across the town, particularly Dobson and Barlow's, which was the biggest one. Uh, and it was over uh, attempts to enforce compulsory overtime and various other issues, relatively minor issues taken on, on themselves, but it became a massive conflict which involved troops being brought in from Manchester, a, a company of hussars were drafted into Bolton, there were police brought in from, from other parts of Lancashire, there were pitched battles when scabs or knobsticks, as they were called in Lancashire then, were brought into the town on the, by train. They were met by crowds of thousands, according to the press reports at Trinity Street Station. And so the, the strike dragged on a very long time. It really mobilized opinion in the town and did have the effect. I know it's something that's beloved of uh, some people on the left who think that strikes will automatically raise people's consciousness, but it doesn't always happen, but it certainly did in this case in Bolton in 1887. There was the beginnings of a socialist movement in Bolton through the Social Democratic Federation, which was a, an early Marxist organisation uh, led locally by a guy called Joe Shufflebotham, who we'll, we'll see a bit more of Joe during the talk. 
And it went from being a, a very tiny organization before the strike with a handful of members to having several hundred members at the end of the strike. So they, they recruited throughout the strike. Uh, they, they stood in local council elections, still didn't manage to get in, although Shufflebotham did manage to get elected onto the school board a couple of years later. So that strike in 1887 had a major impact on Bolton. It radicalised the town without a doubt. And generally the public, including the sort of middle class, the, the professionals, the shopkeepers and so on, were on the side of the strikers. So there was a real popular alliance there in, in support of the, the, the engineering workers. So that laid the basis for the development of other political forces on the left, there was a Labour church, which was a sort of, if you like, a, a cross party organisation, particularly linked to the Independent Labour Party, which had been formed in 1892, but there are also members of the SDF who would go along to meetings and, and if you like, non-aligned socialists and also anarchists. There wasn't that sort of uh, hard and fast, rigid division between Marxists and, and anarchists that, that came to develop later on. There was also the Clarion Cycling Club, of course, which had been formed in the early 1890s. So people like Hannah Mitchell, who some, some of you will have heard of, she was living in Bolton at the time and she found this sort of freedom through going out on a bike with, with, with her friends, like so many other working class women as well as men did. So there's loads going on. Uh, one of the other aspects of all this was it was quite a strong radical liberal tradition in Bolton, and that was very much represented in the Winter Hill events by this guy called Solomon Partington, who was um, a journalist, very much involved in the cooperative movement. Eventually, he became a, a, an independent, if you like, radical socialist liberal and stood for the council, but there was a, that was after the events of 1896. So that's just to give you a feel for it. One other factor which was important was this figure of uh, Alan Clark or Teddy Ashton, uh, as he was known by thousands of his readers of Lancashire dialect sketches. From 1892, he was publishing a, a weekly paper called the Bolton Trotter, which in 1896, um, in uh, March 1896, he, he rechristened Teddy Ashton's journal and it had a wider circulation than just Bolton. It was basically South East Lancashire, the, the textile districts, but it was a combination of political satire, uh, Lancashire dialect sketches, um, walks, cycle rides that readers could take. So it was a, a bit like the Clarion. If you've read through the Clarion, he was certainly uh, had some echoes of Robert Blatchford's writing style. And the two were quite good friends until they fell out over Blatchford's militarism in, in later years. So there was lots going on in Bolton uh, in August 1896, when Ainsworth took this unilateral decision to close the moor. And it was seen as an ideal opportunity uh, by the socialists, particularly the SDF, the Social Democratic Federation, to uh, have a go at Colonel Ainsworth because he was, really was the uh, sort of uh, carbon cut out of Victorian villain uh, type character. He, he hated unions, he hated <laughs> socialists, and so they thought, well, we're going to have a go at this, this fella. And, um, and so they decided on the same night as Smithles Parish Council met to discuss the closure of the moor and decided to have a committee of investigation, this much to Ainsworth's annoyance. Uh, the socialists said, well, never mind a committee of investigation. We, we're going to have a, a mass demonstration to test the right of way. And so they put an advert in the paper, which appeared on Thursday. Let me read it. This was the, the minute of the SDF branch meeting on the 1st of September that the branch advertised in the local paper that they intend to test the right of way over the moors to Winter Hill and members are to meet at the bottom of Halliwell Road at 10 o'clock prompt on Sunday next, September the 6th. So it wasn't just for, for members, obviously anybody was invited to, to come along. So this demonstration was organised with, with less than five days notice. <laughs> but uh, it was a, a phenomenal success. 
people gathered again if any of you from Bolton or Suez ship you know like exactly where where it was at the bottom of Halliwell Road where it diverges from Blackburn Road about a mile outside of Bolton uh, they said they would gather there at 10 o'clock and set off around about half past 10. So there are a few speeches made at the start of the demonstration in front of a, a crowd of several hundred, which thought, oh, that was a reasonable turnout, nice September day like today. And so Shufflebottom spoke, Matt Fair, who was another member of the SDF, and uh, some other local socialists. So they set off up Halliwell Road, which hasn't changed actually that much. It's still a sort of a, a network of, of terrace streets branching off the main road. And as the march carried on up Halliwell Road, uh, the really remarkable thing about this event was that more and more people joined in. Uh, there was an element of carnival to it all. There was a brass band. I think it was St. Marie's band. We're, we're not exactly sure. Was leading the way, and so people thought this was fantastic. Uh, say Ainsworth wasn't a particularly popular character, so quite a few people joined because of that. They also joined just out of a, a sense of uh, curiosity, really. There was this element of carnival to it all. And by the time it got to the top of Halliwell Road, to the Ainsworth Arms pub, named after the Ainsworth family, of course, uh, still there now, and uh, th there were 10,000 people on the demonstration. It was absolutely astonishing, really, the, the way it had grown just in the space of a mile walking up from the bottom of Halliwell Road to the top. And clearly, these were people who were, were from the area. Some of them, uh, we do know for a fact, were, were employees of Ainsworth himself. And uh, some of the, the local people heard about what was going on and set up stalls out, outside the houses selling homebrew beer. So there really was this element of a, a, a the, the carnivalesque to it. Now let me, um, I'll read you one or two excerpts from the, the local press of the day. There were two main papers in Bolton. There was the Bolton Chronicle, and uh, which was a lean towards the Tories, and the Bolton Journal, which, which was more liberal. So the Bolton Journal uh, was, it was standing by the gates of Smiddles Hall, which was Ainsworth's home. It's a very de delightful residence. It said the, the multitude far exceeded what had been anticipated. Looking from the top of the steep hill leading by the gates of Smithles Hall, the sight was a magnificent one. When the processionists emerged from the valley, the road was literally a sea of faces and the multitude comprised thousands of persons of all ages and descriptions. So, uh, which was, you know, exactly the same route was, was taken last Sunday. And it was a fantastic sight watching, you know, it's about 1,200 of us but coming up the hill was uh, with the PCS Samba Band performing. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it was a great sight and clearly had a major impact on, on people locally. Now, once they got to the, the disputed gate that Ainsworth had, had erected to stop people coming, there was a small party of gamekeepers and police conf being confronted by a crowd of 10,000 people. So they weren't much of a match for it. I think there was a, a melee where the uh, local police inspector was thrown over a wall and one of the gamekeepers was, uh, again, uh, somewhat roughly handled. But yeah, I think they have been rather provocative. So at that point, the gate was literally smashed to pieces and the crowd just marched on up the track, which is still exactly as, as it was back then. It was quite a clear track leading up towards Winter Hill. And, and on they went, they got up to Winter Hill itself. And beyond that, uh, I think the, the land ownership was, was different. It, it was beyond the, the Ainsworth estate. They were able to carry on down to the small village of Belmont uh, without any obstruction. Now, the uh, further in, interesting, uh, there was the Solomon Partington commented, onward the leaders marched over the moor, a feature of the day's proceeding being the way all kept to the narrow pathway, here and there, vain attempts have been made to obliterate it. 
And at the end, the, no, is this the journal? Yeah, the Bolton Journal again uh, commented when they'd, once they'd reached Belmont, thus ended a demonstration perhaps unprecedented in the history of Bolton, a great majority returning to the town and the remainder besieging the local hostelries for refreshments. The demand was said to be so great that the wants of the hungry and thirsty ramblers could not be satisfied and the appearance of such a mighty host naturally created much excitement in the village. Now, the, uh, the, the rival Tory paper, the Bolton Chronicle, again was quite sympathetic. He referred to the, uh, the, the landlord of the Wrights Arms doing a roaring business. And altogether, it commented, it was a scene to be remembered, never in the lives of the present generations of Halliwellians or probably any of their progenitors has such a spectacle been witnessed in that district. And it's doubted whether it's like will occur again, but they were wrong. And uh, when people had managed to get back to Bolton some or other, last week we had the, the, the services of uh, a free bus service, which was, was very nice, but back then I think people just walked back. Uh, they were made of stern stuff, clearly. And uh, so it had been a huge success, far exceeded their expectations in terms of numbers. But they realised that they were going to have a fight on the hand. There was a collection uh, taken which uh, raised over four pounds, which was mostly in pennies. So that, that was pretty good in those days. I'm not quite sure what that would translate to in today's money, but it's certainly several hundred pounds. And it was decided that a defence committee would be formed in the event of, of Ainsworth prosecuting people because they had a pretty shrewd idea that Ainsworth wasn't just going to sit back and and accept it. You now he would be determined to take on these people who were trespassing on his land. So the defence committee was formed during that week on the Tuesday night. It was also decided on the Tuesday evening that there would be another demonstration the following Sunday to make the point. And uh, so preparations were then made for that. At this point, Alan Clark, who I've uh, briefly touched on, he was bringing out his next issue of Terry Ashton's journal, which was coming out on the Thursday. And so one of his, he wrote this dialect sketch. He must have just so sort of rattled it off in, in, in a few hours. And it's about Bill Spriggs or Winterhill, likewise Bet and Patsy Filligan, these cut sort of cartoon and cap type characters that are used often to make very, very uh, radical political points, but in a humorous way. And Bill Spriggs or Winter Hill, you know, I would need a, another half hour to read it to you, so I won't attempt to do that. But what he did include in, in this dialect sketch, which came out on the Thursday, was a song called Will You Come A Sunday Morning? And he has uh, Bill Spriggs singing this song, Will You Come A Sunday Morning For A Walk Or Winter Hill? 10,000 went last Sunday, but there's room for 1,000 still. So that really helped to, if, if you like, increase the awareness of what was going on and get people to turn out the following Sunday morning. So it's pretty much um, a repeat of what happened the previous Sunday, except that it rained at the start and, uh, and they weren't able to get a brass band. But they, they, they set off in, in good spirits and once again, by the time they got to the top of Halliwell Road, there were even more people on the demonstration than on the previous Sunday. It was reckoned there was about 12,000 people this time. Uh, they carried on over Winter Hill. There, there was no attempt to stop the march. And there was also another demonstration that took place during the week on a Wednesday afternoon, which is a peculiar uh, day and time to have a demonstration but it was saw that the shop assistants in Bolton who wanted to come on the march who couldn't do uh, I think some, some of the shops on, on Sunday which was a bit odd but the the shopkeepers were saying oh the shop assistants who were quite strongly unionized in Bolton at the time that they wanted to have their own event so about 400 or so people went on the the Wednesday afternoon as well so the, the second really big march a major success more money was collected and it was decided that rather than have a march on the next Sunday morning they would have one on the Saturday afternoon 
because one or two people were saying, well, we don't want to upset people, you know, keep you know, the, the Sabbath and so on. So they had a further march the following Saturday afternoon after people had finished work. In those days, mill workers generally would work till one or two o'clock. And so the march, I think, started at, at two o'clock from the, the same place. Not quite as many on it, though, about half the size of the previous one. And after that, the Defence Committee said, well, maybe, you know, we, we don't want to keep doing marches for the, for the sake of it. Maybe we've made our point, but let, let's look at um, how, how we're going to take things forward in terms of, you know, trying to ensure that the moor is open to the public. By then, Ainsworth had already showed his hand and had issued writs to several of the organisers of the demonstration, including Shuttlebotham, Partington, uh, William Hutchinson, who was uh, the treasurer of the Defence Committee, and many more. Now, it was interesting when uh, they went round with the writs, and there were about 40 issued initially, the guy issuing the writ on behalf of Ainsworth asked each person, are you a socialist? And if you said yes, you'd have the, the writ served on you. If you said you weren't, so well, you know, if you promise not to trespass on the colonel's land, you'll be all right. So it was a really very blatant <laughs> political attempt there. So in the end, there were 10 writs were finally issued very much to the, uh, the the core, if you like, of the Defence Committee, uh, mostly socialists. Partington, I wouldn't say was a socialist, he was certainly a, a, a radical liberal, very much on the left of the, uh, the the Liberal Party. So he, him and Hutchinson, who was also a radical liberal, also had lit, served on them. So there was this, then a long hiatus before the, the case was actually held. It was interesting that the Defence Committee commissioned Richard Pankhurst, the, the husband of Emmeline, to act on, on behalf of the, the, the campaigners. And it was the case was finally heard in Manchester Crown Court, so Manchester Chancery Court, in March 1897. The one thing that ha had happened in, if, if you like, a public sense was that there was a, a demonstration over the moor on Christmas Day which uh, Shufflebotham led, uh, no particular problem. Several hundred people went along it, so it basically kept the momentum going to a certain extent. Now, when the hearing actually took place at the Chancery Court, it was held in front of the, the, the presiding officer, what they call it, it was the Vice-Chancellor Hall, who had a reputation for being, you know, very much a sort of an establishment figure. He did decide, you know, perhaps in, in fairness to him to go out and have a look at the place. So they got him and his flunkies, they got the train to Bolton and then they, they were taken by horse and trap up to Winter Hill in pouring rain, apparently, which didn't dispose him too kindly, I think, for the campaign's case, according to Solomon Partington. And so they were trudging around in, in mud and so on as guests of the Colonel, really. The case itself, it's very interesting look, looking at the, uh, the various testimonies from, from people who, that were heard for the prosecution and also for the defence. There were about 40 people spoke on, on behalf of the, the campaigners, people who'd walked over Winter Hill for generations and the parents had walked over before them. Lots of very, very interesting material about uh, the... Uh, in industrial activities that went on, the coal mining, the quarrying and so on. Uh, the farmers who, who used to sell their own home brewed ale, except they didn't sell it, you'd get it free so they could avoid the licensing laws and you'd buy a piece of cake or something like that to, to cover the cost of the beer. And most of the, the witnesses on behalf of Ainsworth were his employees, a very, very, very large number of his employees were were dragged along probably with their arms twisted to testify in favour of the colonel saying it has always been a, a private um, path that never been a public right of way. So although Pankhurst did a very, very good job in basically producing hard evidence that people had walked over there without let or hindrance for decades, if not longer, the case went in favour 
of Colonel Ainsworth. No big surprise, I suppose. Uh, nobody went to prison, unlike um, Kinder Scouts, where Benny Rothman and, and some of his comrades were imprisoned. But costs of £600 were awarded against the um, Partington and Hutchinson. So that was the secretary and the treasurer of the campaign. Now, uh, a friend of mine said, well, in today's money, that will be £80,000. That's a heck of a lot of, of money. And so the seams, and it's not all that apparent, looking at the, the minute books of the, of the SDF Bolton branch, there's a lot of sympathy for Partington and Hutchinson, but they don't seem to have actually put their hands in the pockets and helped them out. And so I think that led to a split between Partington and Shufflebotham, but uh, that's just surmise. I wouldn't actually, um, I've never seen concrete evidence that that was the case. But um, certainly the SDF, after a while, lost interest in the Winter Hill case. As such, they had other fish to fry, but lots of other issues going on in, in the 1890s. Partington carried on almost a one-man campaign for public rights of way and uh, produced various pamphlets, the, the Truth Pamphlets, which was a series of six pamphlets where he went into great detail, not always uh, terribly accurately, actually, uh, about traditional rights of way in the Bolton area. But he also championed other causes, including women's rights, the campaign against child labour in the mills, along with Alan Clark, who, through his publications like Teddy Ashton's Journal, which became Teddy Ashton's Northern Weekly, um, he uh, publicised Partington's activities. Partington stood for the local council as an independent, not as a liberal, but as, a, as an independent in 1904, and got elected, and he stood in West Ward, which was the area that covered Halliwell, where the uh, original demonstration had basically drawn its base of support from. So he stayed on the council with a year's break till 1911, and again, championed various, uh, if you like, radical causes, but particularly around local public rights, but also children's rights and women's rights to, to get the vote. So it was, uh, did it end there? To a certain extent it did, despite it being such a, a huge event, it never seems to have captured much national attention. It was a big local event and there were attempts made uh, by landowners and also Bolton Council in the early 1900s to close some public rights of way off but they, they got cold feet. They said, oh, we, we don't want to have another Winter Hill on our hands. So it really had a, an impact on people's, local people's thinking, but maybe not on the, the, the national level. And then the First World War came along and just brought, brought the shutters down on, on so much activity. And it wasn't really until 1920 when Alan Clark produced this collection of his uh, newspaper writings in book form, Moorlands and Memories, where he talks about this, these amazing events in 1896, just, all, all, just in the space of a couple of paragraphs. Uh, so he didn't go in, into great depth about it, but it was enough for me anyway to pick it up and then look at the local press reports at the time and the story began to emerge. But probably if there hadn't have been that uh, um, reference in Moreland's and Memories, it might have been for, forgotten still, who knows, because it was very much seen as a local event. One of the, well, there's a, num a number of other interesting factors in all this. On the same day as the first demonstration, am I all right for time, by the way? Yes. Okay. Um, on the same day as the first demonstration, just five or six miles as the crow flies over the moor, the people of Darwin were celebrating getting the freedom of the moors. And there was a big demonstration up to what is now Darwin Tower to celebrate the, uh, the moorland around Darwin being opened up to the people. And again, the Social Democratic Federation had played a key part in that, probably not the leading role, but they were certainly very active in it. And yet there doesn't seem to be much linkage at all between what was going on in Darwin and what was going on in Bolton, Bolton <laughs> a few miles away. 
1932 Kinder Scout. Well, again, I don't think there was uh, any reference at all to what happened at Winter Hill, even though the SDF became, if you like, the key component by numerous switches and changes into what became the Communist Party in 1920. But there wasn't that recognition that, well, we've, we've done this before, <laughs> we've got history here. And it was interesting, uh, a, a friend of mine I was chatting to this morning, who was on the march last Sunday, was talking to somebody, said, well, this is all very well, but it's been taken over by the lefties. Well, actually, the lefties have always <laughs> been, been there in, in the lead for it, thank you very much. But it was, uh, you know, the 1896 event, as was last week's, it was inclusive. And um, whereas, you know, Kinder Scout, it was definitely a case of militant direct action and which, which was needed. And 1932 definitely did have a result. It led to the 1949 uh, National Parks and Access to the Countryside Act. So if Kinder Scout hadn't have happened, the, the chances of the Labour government bringing that legislation in in 1949 might not have been, been quite as strong. So when people say, well, what was the impact of the, the Winter Hill mass trespass? Say, so, well, it, it was a slow burn, shall we say. It took another hundred years before that road over Winter Hill was finally registered as a public right of way. And that was obviously the, the, the centenary year and Bolton Council, which was the Labour Council then, uh, were very supportive in attempts to dedicate that route clearly as a public right of way. Should be said that in the, the interwar years, Ainsworth sold his land to Bolton Council. And although it was never shown on, on maps, on urban survey maps, people just got back into the habit of walk, walking over the road without let or hindrance. But uh, it, it was a hundred years before the, the council finally went through this quite complicated process of registering the route as a right of way. The first actual commemoration of Winter Hill was in 1982, which was the, the 86th anniversary. He said, well, why are you doing this on the 86th? Said, well, we've only just found out about it, so we're gonna do it. We're not gonna wait till 1996, you know, when it's a centenary. And again, it was from the, the Bolton Socialist Club, which was directly linked to the SDF. It was the SDF's social club from uh, 1895, I think it is. Um, it's still in it's the same place it's occupied since 1905 on Wood Street. Uh, it's beginning to open up slowly. And we did a talk at Wood Street Socialist Club in June 1982, um, based on the research that I've done, uh, following on from discovering the Alan Clark connection. And one guy, Pal of mine, Harvey Scowcroft, said, well, well, why don't we organise a, you know, a commemorative march this September? Said, yeah, yeah, why not? <laughs> so, so that's how the first commemoration came about. We um, got various people involved in the art scene in Bolton to get involved. Uh, we had songs were written about it. There were two plays uh, written about the, the mass trespass. Uh, Will You Come a Sunday Morning by Les Smith and Neil Duffield did one later on and the Les Smith's play was performed at various pubs uh, along Halliwell Road and in other parts of Bolton in the run-up to the event. So uh, estimates vary as to how many came, probably a little bit, a few more than who were on the, the march last week, but around about 1500 so on. We had e Eagley Band, we had uh, clog dancers and all sorts of stuff and nice weather. So that was a 1982 celebration. There was another one in 1996 and then last week's. So the, uh, the memory is probably stronger than ever. I think it, it really did capture the imagination of people in Bolton and also from, from other parts of the, the, the north of England. People came over from Sheffield, from Red Rope. There was a, a strong contingent from Pendle in, in East Lancashire and so on. So the, the big question we're being asked now is, well, are you going to do it again next year? <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of work to organise it, but maybe some sort of event would be good. Uh, the other thing I've not mentioned, actually, is quite an important part of the more recent story, 
Bolton Council sold the land to the Woodland Trust a few years ago. Now, you, you might have come across the Woodland Trust. I would certainly re recommend joining them. They, they do a good job. Um, they're a charity. And so they've taken over the stewardship of, of all that land that belonged to, to Ainsworth. And so they were very good partners in terms of organising the event, making sure everything was, was done right. We live in quite a, you know, a safety conscious world, quite, quite rightly now. So they were saying, well, you know, make sure you got your public liability insurance, sort of things that we didn't bother about in 1982 or even 1996 for that matter. But they, they were great people to work with. And so they may well, uh, w with the, the very informal organising committee, um, do something ne next year and make it an annual event. The, the other thing which I suppose it has slight echoes of is, you know, some of you will have heard of Bolton's Walt Whitman connection, which is also very much thanks to Alan Clark, keeping the memory of that going. Um, we, we do the annual Walt Whitman walk on the, uh, at, at the end of May. So something like that, that's relatively low key, that doesn't involve too much uh, sleepless nights and trying to um, get, get huge crowds across busy uh, dual carriageway roads like Mossbank Way. Uh, that, that's the sort of thing that we might be up for doing next year. So all, the only other thing to say is, uh, there are various people are in the process of, of making films about the event, I've already made them. There's one on YouTube called Mass Trespass by Nigel Coates, which is a good, very, very good overview. Lots of interviews with people on the day itself last week. And uh, there are more being made. And I should also say my new book, well, it's an updated edition of the, the biography of Alan Clark, which has a lot on Winter Hill, ditto the, the book Moreland's Memories and Reflections, which was a centenary celebration of his 1920 Moreland's and Memories. I've got copies there. Um, and I think that that's about it. Th thank you for listening and thank you everybody on, on Zoom as well. <laughs> Welcome questions. Thank you. is take questions from the floor here live first of all if anybody would like to wave a hand yes please uh, it's just about the, the, the mass, mass uh, press of winter hill was essentially about a what part of a right was part of it wrong and what seemed to count about a right to wrong mm -hmm. wherever you wanted to go could you just repeat the question for the yeah the um the, the, the question is, was uh, you know, what the original 1896 event was over a particular track, uh, which was regarded as being public. Now, the, the, one of the many differences with Kin Scout is, was it over a general right to roam, over, over just land that was in private ownership? And so You've answered the question uh, that yeah, it, uh, Kinder Scout was very much about general access, not on a particular uh, track or path, as, as far as I understand it, anywhere. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Um, well, I'm actually interested in, in what you started off with, which is the context, because what was very fascinating I found going that thing the last Sunday was to be reminded of the radicalism of the whole area. You know, there were people from Darwin, there were people from there, there were people from over Pendle and whatnot. And I was, and it set me wondering about the nature of the, the radicalism in the area. You talk about a lot of it in both. Is, is the connectedness between the urban radicalism and, and the landscape. I, I, I'd just be sort of interested mm. in, any thoughts you have on that? Because I think that's actually really quite distinctive about that area that you didn't get to see. Well, sure. again, if you could sure. just yeah. that. Sure, hey. yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, Gillian's question was about the, the nature of, of radicalism in that part of Lancashire in the 1890s and the, the link, if you like, between <laughs> urban radicalism, because these people were, were coming from uh, very densely populated urban working class areas. Uh, asserting the right of way to access the countryside. And so, yeah, again, I think you, you've sort of 
that answered the question. I think that it was something that people felt very passionately about. It was almost on people's doorsteps. You, you could w walk up to Winter Hill in probably it'd take you about an hour from the uh, you know the sort of densely populated streets of, of Halliwell. Similarly, in Darwin, you, you could walk from the, the sort of little, you know sort of stone terrace cottages up onto Darwin Moor in in less than that actually. So people very felt very passionately about these places. It was you know you, you didn't need to be able to afford a train fare to go to Blackpool. You could. Uh, you, probably at worst you might have to get on a tram to the top of Halliwell Road and then walk from there similarly at, at Darwin going going up to Whitehall but then you had access to the countryside very very easily. Um, I think the, the other thing that, that's worth mentioning again is the, uh, the the Clarion Cycling Club which was formed I think it was 1894 in Birmingham of all places. I think it should have been formed in, in Lancashire, really, but <laughs> good on the, the Brummies for doing it. And uh, but it very quickly spread to the, the cotton towns, both in, in Lancashire and Yorkshire. And that, again, was a, an affordable way for working class people to get out into the countryside, um, meet other socialists, do a bit of uh, socialist propagandising in the village greens and, and so on. And uh, generally have, have a nice time. There's a whole network of uh, Clarion clubhouses, both for cyclists and for walkers, which were like, um, you know, country clubs, but that were affordable and fantastic idea. What a shame that uh, we, we don't have such things. We got the fantastic Clarion house in uh, up on the on Pendle, which is, is still going strong after all these years. But I think what was particularly interesting, I suppose, was the fact that you have these places where people could actually um, stay for the weekend or, or even longer, and it was affordable and very nice places, looking at the, the photographs of them that have survived. Yes, another question? Thank you. Can you tell us about the challenges to promotion and photographs? Yes, it, it did. It, oh, sorry, the, the, the question is, did, did it spawn other challenges to uh, footpath closures? Yeah, definitely in the Bolton area, but, but not wider than that. And one of the things that Partington did was to form a, a, was a public rights of way defence committee, which was quite localised. And I think that was linked in to more national and, and regional initiatives. I've, I've not done perhaps as much research as I should do on that, but that tended to, to fizzle out, but was overtaken by other national activities. And the Beaver Northern. Yeah, and I went... The Beaver Northern is a big one. Yeah, we were, we were just saying about the Peak and Northern Footpath Society, which is still very much alive and well, I think. Yeah, well, lots really of really signs. good signs. And that was 1894, was it, when it was formed? Yeah. It, it's a common a question, um, but I'm the secretary of the Manchester Random Report, and mm -hmm. I did some research into their history. Very low level of research, but <coughs> there's a challenge to a closure of what happened in Derbyshire. It's called Doctor's Gate. Um, a landowner had acquired some land in the part of the enclosure. And closed this footpath, which was essentially an item of way. And the people in Northern challenged them, you know, they mm -hmm. sort of wrote to them and pleaded with them and mm -hmm. <laughs> cajoled this land there. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened. But then Sheffield Clarion Club and Manchester Abandoning Club began to assert their right of way. They went and they broke the locks and they marched over the land. And Essentially reclaimed it. And I think that was 19, just before the First World War. Ended. Right, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the comment from the lady was that the, uh, for, for those listening on Zoom, was that there were, <laughs> sorry, uh, that there were other events took place before the First World War, in, including a, an issue in, in Derbyshire at Doctor's Gate, you say, where uh, the landowner closed the land off and so there was direct action by the ramblers 
in Manchester and Sheffield to reclaim, which they were successful in doing. Yeah. And of course, Sheffield Clarion was very, very uh, well known, wasn't it? What, what was the name of the, um, the guy who... Ward, yeah. G, was it G.H.B. Ward? Who was a, yeah, a, a redoubtable character who really sort of you know, did, did a lot to assert public rights through the, the clarion movement before and I think after the First World War as well. And it was nice that there were so many people who came over from Sheffield last week to take part in the, the Winter Hill event. Mm -hmm. Just like a, to ask a quick question about the stones, which I assume is put up in 1992. Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And that's where they've got me knowing about the Continental Battle League, but uh, just not checked it. Can you tell me just who put that up? Yeah, the. the um, Chris was asking about the commemorative stone at the where the disputed gates was at Winter Hill. Uh, this stone was erected in 1996 as part of the centenary celebrations, funded by Bolton Council. And back in the day, they had the, the City Challenge Fund, and I think we got some money from that. And so it was uh, officially dedicated, I think, the, the day before the actual commemorative walk. And one of the interesting things about it, the, uh, I think it was a great nephew of Colonel Ainsworth came along, he was living you know, quite elderly, uh, living in the south of England. So he, he came along to take part in it and he was su such a nice guy and say, well, yeah, uh, that, that was then. And, you know, but on behalf of the Ainsworths, you know, sorry guys. <laughs> Yeah, sure. The, uh, the 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 Zoom for, for the benefit of the Zoomers, the, the the question is, or the comment is about existing public rights of way are still very often obstructed. And I think one of the points that were made very strongly um, in in the publicity that we put out before last week's walk was that uh, this isn't just about you know something that happened. 125 years ago, there is still a threat to public rights of way today. And so we do need to be vigilant and support the efforts of groups like the Ramblers who are, who are trying to identify routes which might not be uh, necessarily on the definitive map of, of rights of way, but are regarded as being public and people walk on them, that these do really need to be registered in the, in the next few years before the, uh, the axe comes down, if you like, uh, in this legislation that the, the Tory government put, put through recently. So other people in the room might know more about it than, than I do. So it, it's, uh, I think the, the point is well made that we do need to make sure that, you know, it's not just something that happened years ago and everything's all right now, it isn't, you know, there's still, well, I think is it something like 8% of the, um, the, there's only 8% of the, of the land in England, which is mm. it publicly owned mm. and the rest is private and uh, with, with dubious access. I think Guy Shubsoul's book and Guy was on the march last week, you know, goes into that in a, in a lot of detail, very valuable book. Should we have a look and see whether anybody on Zoom wants to ask a question? Yeah, shall, shall we swap? We'll swap, we'll swap see. <laughs> let's see. Hello. Hello, Zoomers. Uh, let's see. There's things in the... Ah, yes, we have a, we have a question from uh, Peter Smith. 
Was it the case that the original organisers were tried for breaching an injunction, not for the actual trespass? It was... Um... Well, shall we do uh, I think can can you hear Paul if he if he talks start, start to talk yeah. Paul let's say we... yeah the, the writ was to restrain people from trespassing on Ainsworth land. Could you hear that, folks? Give me a thumbs up. Yes, yes, they could. <laughs> right, okay. Um, and Andrew Bibby wants everyone to know that the Clarion Cyclist National Rally at the New Church in Pendle Clarion mm. House is this coming Sunday. Mm. Right, anybody else on Zoom want to wave at me and we'll see if we can unmute you and see how that works. Or um, put your hand up if you, if you can't wave at me, if you see what I mean. No. Oh, they're, quite, they're quieter on Zoom than they usually <laughs> are, you know, come on, don't be shy. <laughs> Or, 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 have we, or, or people here asked the question, the questions that you would have asked as well. Has anybody right? Well, we've got somebody else in the room. You've missed your chat. No, no, no. We're, we're, keep keep thinking. But Ali, yes, what's your question? It's um, only a very simple question. How did they pay the fine? Um, how did they pay the fine? How did they pay the fine? Says Ali. It's a good question, Ali. Um, I think Partington. From, so the, there were two people who had costs awarded against them, Partington and, and Hutchinson. And um, I think Hutchinson, were, Hutchinson was probably middle class with, with, with a bit of an income. He may well have, have paid it himself. Partington, he was still complaining, oh, quite rightly, uh, uh, well into the early 1900s that, um, you know, he still had this fine hanging over him. So it, it's a bit unclear as to whether he did, in the end, pay up, what happened to the money that was collected by the Defence Committee, what, what that was used for, was it, was it just used to pay for the legal costs of the, the trial, which would have been substantial, although I would imagine um, Pankhurst would probably have, have waged, uh, waived most of his fees. Um, so it, it's something that's not at all clear. I have sort of tried to keep an eye on for what, where there might be references to it from what Partington himself was saying. But it's never been entirely clear, and it was a lot of money. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. Well, mm. gosh, if it's not clear mm. to you and all the research no. that you've mm. done over, over the well, years. There's, there's, there's still stuff out there, I'm absolutely sure. You know. right. still start, well, yeah, we always like to leave people saying, yes, there's still research to be done. Mm. Still, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, mm. uh, that sounds true of this one. Although uh, it, it's been terrific to, to have Paul mm. here, obviously, has been so in, engaged in all of this for so long and fantastic that it has uh, come to fruition on a, on a, lov a lovely day on the 5th of September with the walk and, uh, and then a lovely mm. day here today as well. So uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, are we, do we, well, yeah, before, uh, have we got any final questions? Oh, wow, we have got, got yes, and we got, oh, it's all right, they're, 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 they're warming up on Zoom. <laughs> uh, uh, did the Clarion Mag mention the Winter Hill event? Says Andrew. That's a good question. Um, I've, I've not seen a reference to it. Um, it is on, available online now, actually, isn't it? So uh, it would be easy enough to check that. I think when I did the original research in 1982, I, did, I certainly looked at the, the SDF National Newspaper Justice, and there, there was bits in there. But I've not looked at the Clarion, because the Clarion didn't seem to be all that involved on, on the actual events, interestingly. But, so yeah, that, that will be something that be quite easy to do, actually. To do. Okay, bit of research for you there, Andrew. Mm. <laughs> Come back and, and let right. us know. Lois, were you wanting to so I'll, I'll get you to unmute yourself? See what, see if this works. See if people here can hear you. I was just reminding you about oh, Oliver's poem. Uh, oh, no. Unfortunately, I think that's sorry, and I can't do chat. We didn't do the extra. Bit the, with the data projector. Lois, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to put you put it in the chat. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, I can't okay. do that. <laughs> there we go, we're, we're, we're learning. We're, what we need to do next time is mm. make sure we've got the link with the data projector because that will also give us the, the speaker. It's a nuisance. 
So while while Lois is typing away there, let's hope she's a fast typist and it wasn't, it's not a long question, sorry Lois. <laughs> I'll, I'll just uh, let people know that we, we did a podcast last year as part of um, our Arts Council project, uh, Begin the World Over Again, which was on the right to roam. Um, and uh, and uh, it's a very interesting, though I would say that one night, but no, it, 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 you head dead to our website uh, and look for the projects bit. And there are six different <laughs> podcast episodes, but one of them particularly, yeah. Uh, does focus on the right to roam and I know that uh, Nick Hayes who's also written an mm -hmm. interesting book of trespass he, he was interviewed yeah. as, as part of that by uh, uh, by our, our our volunteers so um yeah okay here we have Lois's question Jane. no we don't no. she's still typing Jane, okay yes no. my colleague Jane is reminding us of our yes. poem which <laughs> yes <laughs> Uh, ah, found, well done, Jane. Yes, yeah. Uh, right. Stuart Barlow is asking whether the full words of the song you mentioned are available. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, they are available in Paul's book, which is still come. This is still in print. Uh, there are two copies left. <laughs> <laughs> two copies. But One of them's there. Well, well that's yeah. my own, so you can't have that. Yeah, we, do, we, we have a copy in the library, as we have uh, copies of, of, of other books of Paul's in the library, so you are most welcome to come and, and make an appointment to, uh, to read it here if you, can't, if you can't find it elsewhere. And um, this, have we got anybody else with a question here? Well, I'm, I'm putting Lois under a lot of pressure right? as she has a question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, Chris. <laughs> Chris. Chris is hoping that Ainsworth is going to a sticky end. <laughs> no. <laughs> the, the, the answer is, is no. And uh, there was, there's still photographs that, that turn up showing uh, Ainsworth, his family, and in these sort of entourage. There's one on Facebook just the other day. And uh, there were there were really uh, three key figures from the from the Ainsworth. There's Ainsworth himself, Mrs. Ainsworth, who, if if anything, was even a, a more ferocious reactionary than, than him. And his vicar, they have their, their own vicar at Smiddles Hall, the Reverend Standen, who was again equally reactionary. <laughs> and uh, there is a story that, that Mrs. Ainsworth used to go around the uh, the ladies' toilets at the bleach works with a, with a stick in the days when you know the toilets used to have a gap underneath, and she used to have this big stick and she'd fiddle it around with, with a stick if it was. A, any uh, female in, in the toilet there skiving away. <laughs> Get out, you know, you're not paid to sit in there. <laughs> so uh, they're a, a pretty unsavory lot, really. <laughs> Chris is now starting a campaign to topple the statues. Right, yeah, the no, there's, uh, there's a portrait of him in, in Smiddles Hall. Smiddles Hall, oh. which was his obviously the, the family home that passed to Bolton Council and it's still owned by Bolton Council as part of the museum service and the uh, the Woodland Trust also a, a, a base there so there's quite a lot about the, uh, the, the events of 1896 and, and Ainsworth's role in it you know written in uh, you know an, an objective way you know because a lot of these places they say oh what a wonderful person he was you know and how he you know, tr treated all his, his, his workers so well, blah, 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 which is a, usually a lot of rubbish anyway. So you, you really couldn't get away with that with, with Ainsworth. It would be stretching the uh, hist history far too much. But in uh, Smiddles Hall is well worth having a look at. There's a lot there about the, you know, the history of it goes back a, a long, long way, well before the Ainsworths. And on the day, the, the other week, Bolton Library and uh, Museum Service organised a number of events at Smiddles Hall as, as well as the wall. But quite a few people found that you know a seven-mile walk over pretty rough land was was expecting a lot. So we had this event taking place with uh, various things going on in the hall itself. So that, that was quite a nice balance, really, with a, a, a rather arduous trek in rather hot weather. If anything, the, the weather was too too warm. <laughs> 
Well, you can't complain about that no, at all, no. no. Right. <laughs> I, th I think we've got, oh, okay. We've, we've, we've got. Yes. Is it okay. open all the time now? Because I know they've built houses around us and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. The old coaching house. Yeah. That, that's gone, isn't that, it? That's, that's gone, gone in sadly. Yeah, right, yeah. Okay. But the hall itself, the hall you itself know, is, is open, it's open. Yeah. Mm. The hall is open. Okay. We've got one more question on Zoom, and I'm going to take that, I think, as the last question. And I'm going to, then I'm going to move this because you don't want to stare at me. So I'm going to move this across <laughs> and, and uh, give Paul a chance to ask, ask answer that last question. And then he will read the poem, mm -hmm. which is I Right to Rome, before. and it's by Oliver uh, James Lomax, who is very apologetic that he couldn't at the last minute join us as, as planned. Oliver wrote it, having sat in our reading room um, and read, we have a lot of material about Benny Rothman and the, the Kindermass Trespass, and he read the notes that Benny Rothman wrote before his court appearance, mm -hmm. uh, and out of it came his poem, but it links Winter Hill with the Mass Trespass uh, of Kinder Scout. So we will um, we will finish with that, and then I'll do a kind of a, 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 a tale a, a trail for next week's talk. But uh, so the last question from Don: Did the church and chapel folk oppose the walks because they were on Sundays? And I'll move this across so you should be able to see. There you go. Uh, yeah, some of them did, and I think that was why they decided with the third big demonstration it would be on a Saturday because they were conscious that they, they wanted to keep it as a sort of very broadly based campaign, although it's ironic that, in, uh, that there were far fewer people on the Saturday afternoon walk than there were on the, the, the previous two Sundays. So, um, you know, I think people would have found reasons to, to complain. But I think we can sometimes exaggerate how religious people were then. That's one of the things that slightly surprised me looking at, at, at some of the, the testimonies, um, you know, we assume that everybody went to church. Well, no, they didn't actually, uh, particularly working class people. Um, they weren't that, that avid churchgoers, even them, yeah. So I thought that helps. <laughs> shall, I, shall I do my... <laughs> well, I was originally going to read this at the start, but it's, it's probably as good to read it at the end as, as well given that I actually forgot to read it at the start. Uh, but also, uh, I should say that um, in 1982, when we did the first commemoration, Benny Rothman was quite involved in that. He came up uh, a, a few days before and we, I sort of showed him the, the route of the original trespass and he came on the walk itself, you know, so it was great having that very strong link between Kinder Scouts and, uh, and Winter Hill. So this as Lynette says, it's called Right to Rome and was written after reading Benny Rothman's trial defence notes here in the Working Class Movement Library. And leaving the landscape of your scrawled page, I turn left out of yonder gate where the moor floods a mind, mythic with purple heathers and dark rock pools of time. And a mermaid with all her common majesty grants us both immortality. And when the darkness tried to own the light, to keep for itself in the private night, the stars came out to trespass the sky and burn witness to the lie. And if this poem was a sixpenny Woolworths map and this compass needled a single blade of grass, quietly protesting between two cobbled stones, but calling to you, the right to roam for all that is free can never be owned. And when the darkness tried to warn the light to keep for itself in the private night, the stars came out to trespass the sky and burn witness to the lie. And yours is a whisper that picks the lock to kinder scout from Edale Cross, walking freely in your waking loss. I marvel at this view from the top, the wind farm's mass crucifixion. And there in the middle distance, 10,000 souls on Winter Hill, Freedom walks where freedom will. And when the darkness tried to own the light to keep for itself in the private night, the stars came out to trespass the sky and burn witness to the light. That's Oliver James Lomax, an excellent poet. Yeah. Yeah. Well <laughs> Incidentally, there's a very good exhibition on at the moment in the Platform 5 gallery at Bolton Station, 
of uh, artists from New Mills, which are obviously right on the edge of Kinder Scouts, and artists from, from Bolton. It's part of the New Mills Festival. And that's on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from 12 till 4. And there's some great stuff, in, including some fantastic paintings about Kinder Scout and, and access to the moors. In fact, there's one I'm quite tempted to buy, actually, when it's, when it's finished. So that's where we'll see. Platform 5 on Bolton Station, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Wow. I hope I'm not making you seasick there on Zoom, but uh, right. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, thank you all for joining us, both in person and on Zoom. And do please let us know how our first hybrid session has been for you and if there's ways in which you think we can improve it. We hope you can join us either in person or online next week. Please check our website for the link to book tickets to attend in person. If you're on Zoom, you can just click on the link on the day. So on Wednesday, the 22nd of September at 2 p.m., Harry Taylor will be here and his talk is entitled Victor Grayson, a reappraisal of the life and politics of Britain's lost revolutionary. Thanks very much again to Paul and to all our contributors today, both here and far distant. Best wishes in solidarity from all at the Working Class Movement Library. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.